Thank you very much, Brother Neville, and we be seated. I believe it was said once, uh, I was happy when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, we are sorry that we don't have room or seating room for all that are present, and perhaps we'll grow through the coming week of people coming in, hearing of the meetings. But the reason for this special time was that we would... Um, of all my heart, the Holy Spirit had laid this warning of conviction that the church in this day should have this message, because I believe that it is the most outstanding messages of the Bible, because it reveals Christ and his church at this time. Then no one can have faith or know what they're doing or where they're going unless they have some something to base their thoughts and faith upon. Therefore, if the Scripture has revealed Christ to us in these last days and the condition of time, it would do us good to to search it and find out where we're at. Now we're. We're sorry that our church is not larger. Someday we're hoping to have. And these last four days, especially studying for this upon the historical part of the of the book of Revelation, I have run into things that I never thought was really ever happened. And it's even brought to me a, a feeling that after this seven church ages, I have been through that, I would like to have another such series of bringing up the, the true church and the false church together, and uh, just through the history and scripture. As one time I endeavored on a sermon to take the true vine and the false vine found in the Bible, and we are... We are going to try to get some chairs, while I'm thinking of the people trying to be seated. Um, we're going to get, try to get some more chairs to try to fill up the rooms back here and out and some more around so that we can seat a few more people doing the services. Now, on this, I would ask each one of you who are really concerned about these things would, would come every time that we are going to to explain it. Now, I would not undertake, or did I think myself, undertake to explain this great book of the Revelation of the seven church ages, but I am depending solemnly upon God for, for to reveal it to me just as I come to it. The natural history, which is of the taken from the most outstanding historians that I know of. I have laying in my study room right now about five or six commentaries, Hossus to Babylon's Fox Book of the Martyrs, and other great books like the Pre-Nicene Council, about four books on that, around 400 pages in each book. And there the Nicene Council and all the history that we can because behind us from the magnetic tape we're going to write a commentary on the seven church ages to send to all the world that we can because we are in the last days. We are at the end time. It never dawned upon my heart so much until the, the last election and then I seen where we were at and the Holy Spirit began to reveal to me to, to warn the people and to place this and I cannot do it in a a church like this sufficiently, and then if I sat down and just wrote the book, I feel that if I got to the pulpit and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit amongst the Christians came up on me to help me, then I would be more sufficient to write the book then yeah. after I took it off the tape because there we'd get the inspiration of it. The books, of course, will be uh, a kind of straightened up a little because in here we put things in that we could not put in the book, and then we and we take too much time on repeating ourselves, or I do, 
and then in the book it'll all be straightened out. But we're going to try to get it all as much as we can on tapes. Now the tapes each night, the literature and so forth, the boys will have it just out the building there. Now, I may not be able each night, as we have taken upon ourselves to try for the glory of God, to to bring these seven church messages, their seven church ages, in seven nights, taking each night an age, like Monday night, Ephesus, Tuesday night, Smyrna, Wednesday night, Pergus, Thursday night, Thyatira, Friday night, uh, Sardis, and Saturday night, um, Philadelphia, and Sunday morning and Sunday night, the Lady Ocean, the church age that we're living in, giving the historical of the original church and the, and the writers and the historians and the angels of that age and, and the messages and the run of the church as it's come down through to this time. And it's amazing to see how every prediction of that scripture hits solid with history. Amen. Just Amen. exactly to the solid. It even amazed me so much till yesterday I had read it felt like my eyes were swelling out. And I come out and I said to the wife, I have never dreamed of it being that way. See how great it was. And now, sometime I may not be able to get it all over in one night, the church, the message to the church. And if I cannot get it over at night, then the next morning at 10 o'clock will be announced each night to those who want to come and listen to the rest of it because we're going to try to get it on the tape. I will have services then from 10 o'clock at morning on until noon. Uh, in the daytime, to try to get it out, the rest of the message, because they can catch it on the tape. Not We've announced that there won't be any healing services because it, we're trying to keep under the uh, prophetic uh, utterance of the Bible. Then we had a healing service just recently here. And then after this services are over, then we'll have a healing services again back at the place. But I... I want to make this real clear so everybody can remember that now in here it may cut and pull and give us all a great shaking. But I'm responsible not for for nothing but preaching the Word. That's all. Just, just holding right to the Word. And many times it might, in these church ages, might reflect upon somebody's denomination. And if it does that, it's not meant to be with harshness. It, it is just stating what the Scripture has said and the revelation I have of it. And if you think that I'm wrong in it, then do not hold it against me. Just uh, pray for me that God will show me what is right. For I certainly want to be right. And then another thing, realizing that the responsibility that I have in, in such a meeting as this, that teaching to people that the Holy Spirit will hold me responsible for the words that I say in this pulpit. So you see how solemnly we approach this. Now, our, I would have had this out somewhere else, but being that it's teaching, then in our out in the evangelistic services, every one of us has... Uh, an idea or, or discernment or like it's been through the age and we have our own churches and what our churches taught us and what we believe. We, I don't like to go in someone else's church or among people like that and say something that's contrary to what people has been taught. For after all, I've clearly tried to make my statements that a, if a man is a Catholic and he's depending on the Catholic Church for salvation, he's lost. If he's a Baptist, depending on the Baptist Church, he's lost. Or a Pentecostal, depending on the Pentecostal Church to save him, he's lost. But any church, but if that individual is solemnly resting upon faith in the finished works of Christ at Calvary, He's saved. I don't care what church you belong to. Because by faith are you saved. And that by grace. Now, sometimes in doing this, and I think in my own little building here that we started many years ago, just with an old a bunch of concrete blocks and things, and it's kind of a sacred spot to us. 
We just hate to see it change in one way because this is where God first began to meet with us when we even didn't have a floor in it. But it's, it's got to a place now until it's getting old and we're in a building, building program here to fill this block with a church here. Now, until then, I feel that when I come back off of the field where I won't hurt brethren and their messages and so forth, then it gives me the right to express my own opinion out, out, of, my, out of the pulpit here. And so, if you say, I have been taught a little different, I would, and then in this, we just invite anybody that wants to come. See, there's nobody sponsoring it or anything. It's the tabernacle here. And anybody that wants to come, just welcome to come. Just come right on. So, uh, I invite you to bring your Bible every meeting and bring a pencil and paper. And now, with all the commentaries and so forth, I could not have brought all the books, so I just wrote right down each time uh, upon paper here little notes from history and commentaries and so forth that I might be able to just read it from the, the notes here instead of having the book and turning through the pages. However, when it comes to the Scripture, we'll use the Bible. And then in the commentary, I'll explain or the history, who the historian was that said it and so forth. Then, in the, of course, in the um, event of the coming a book, well, then we can type it up all right then and can get everything to the ditto right. Now, we will do everything that we can to start early and let out as early as possible. It will be eight days meeting, Sunday through Sunday. This morning, I am starting the first chapter of Revelation, of the book of Revelations, and Revelations is set in three parts. And first three chapters is what we'll be dealing with in these eight days when one church age could take us a month. But we'll just have to hit the high places, as we call it. Then when you get the book, it'll be written out more in detail. Now, Revelations, the first three chapters, deals with the church. Then the church disappears. We see it no more until the end time. From Revelations 1 to 3 is the church. Revelations 4 to 19 is Israel, a nation. And 19 to 22 is both together and the plagues and the warnings and so forth at the end. Set in three parts. And we're taking the first three chapters pertaining to the church and the church age that we're living in. Now, first it may seem kind of dry because we have to go back and make a foundation. I've prayed and studied and done everything that I could to try to, to get the feeling of the Holy Spirit which way to set this that the people will see it. And that you might, in seeing it, be enlightened and cause you to come closer to Christ. For we're at the end time. And it's such a marvelous thing as I've been studying the histories to find how that church began and how it pulled off and what's taking place and to see that little seed of God move through every one of those ages completely go out nearly in one place. Now, tomorrow night we'll begin and have a... Have a a chart here, not a chart, but a blackboard that I want to kind of teach it from a blackboard. I believe the Sunday school teacher, one of them has a blackboard. I see it in the back. I'm going to have the janitor bring it up and put it here in the front so I can teach from that blackboard and write it out so you'll be sure and you can draw it on your paper and so forth and get it close as we can bring it. But I want to just say this before starting. To see the beginning of the church age and to see how the apostles the doctrines and things that they taught and the principles of the Bible. And then to see that church about the second round of apostles, how it began to fade away, the real true teaching. The third round, getting way away. By the fourth round, it had faded out into a, a lukewarm. 
the church brought forth a lukewarm church and then a spirit-filled church, which I say this with godly respect to every man's religion, from the beginning to this time, the real true church has been a Pentecostal church. It is true God has reserved this church. Now I often wonder when Jesus made the remark, said, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. I often wondered what that meant, but I understand it now. Last week we had a meeting at Shreveport, Louisiana. The greatest spiritual meeting I ever went into in my life. Shreveport. I was had a couple days of vacation. And I went down in Kentucky with a brother, Wood, here, one of the deacons of the church, or trustees, brother, to hunt. We went into the woods. I shot the first squirrel. And I said, I'll just wait because someone comes through with some dogs. And I said, I'll just wait till the squirrels come back out of the holes and up in the trees, in the holes and hid. And I said, when they come out, I'll sit here and wait because it's real cold and frosty. And ears of burning and, you know, the, the keen winds coming through the hollers. I said, I'll just wait till the squirrels come back out. No more than sit down until the Holy Spirit said, rise. Go up in the place that you call Sportsman's Holler. There I'll speak with you. And I went up into this place that I named Sportsman's Holler because the reason I named those hollers myself so I know where it was at. Sportsman's Holler was because he had... I went in there and saw 16 squirrels sitting on one tree, shot the limit, left the rest of them there, and went away. And that's the sports, the thing to do. So then I called it Sportsman's Holler, and he referred to me the place that you call Sportsman's Holler. Not that he called it, but I called it that. Then I went up at the head of that holler and sat down under a white oak tree and waited about a half hour. Nothing happened. I laid myself on the ground. Prostrated myself on the ground, laid my hands out. Then he spoke to me. And when he did the words that he revealed to me on this very scripture that we're coming to this morning, I'd never seen it before in all my life. And then when I got to Shreveport, Louisiana, a woman who is a gifted woman, her name is Mrs. Schrader, Many years ago when the angel of the Lord met me down here at the river the first time and appeared in that light and the words that he spoke there, 11 years later when I walked into a meeting, this little woman rose and spoke in tongues and interpreted. It was word for word the same thing that angel said. And this same little woman, when I walked into the tabernacle at, or the place of Shreveport that we were in, the uh, life tabernacle, the Holy Spirit moved on that woman and said word for word what he said to me up there on the hill. <coughs> then the Spirit began to move and give interpretations, foretelling things by the revelation, by prophecy, the things that would happen in the meeting the following night. And not one time did it fail. Amen. Before that, a little woman stood up in the meeting, a Baptist woman, come over there not knowing what she could do. And she was standing in the midst of the meeting and the Holy Spirit fell on her and she began to speak with tongues. A Baptist woman from the First Baptist Church of Shreveport and then she didn't know what she did and then before she could say anything the Holy Spirit gave the interpretation Thus saith the Lord. Within three months there will be the spirit of Moses, Elijah, and Christ ministering in this tabernacle. There it happened perfectly. A Baptist man from Meridian, Mississippi started laying his hand on his refrigerator to get something out of the refrigerator and the Spirit of God come up on him and he spoke in tongues, not knowing what he was doing. And before he got could understand what he was doing, the Holy Spirit spoke back and said, Go to Shreveport, Louisiana. My servant will tell you what to do. And he come there and said, I don't understand this. Never happened before. Oh, my. We are living in the last days just before the coming of the Lord. That little church has been always in the minority. The Pentecostal, I am not meaning the denominational Pentecostals, I'm not meaning, but the people with the Pentecostal experience 
Pentecost is not an organization. Pentecost is an experience that goes to whosoever will, Catholic, Jew, proselyte, Methodist, Baptist, whosoever will let him come. It's an experience that the individual, God doesn't deal with a denomination, neither does he deal with the Gentiles as a, a race or a people. He deals with individuals. Amen. Whosoever will, let it be white, black, yellow, brown, Methodist, Baptist, Protestant, Catholic, whatever he is, let him come. Amen. Whosoever. I'm so glad he made it that way. Amen. I Like the fellow said once, I'd rather he'd say that than to call my name. Amen. Let William Branham come, because he might be more than one William Branham. But when he said, whosoever, I know that took me. So that's the way we can all feel. Whosoever will let him come. Now, I know there's many people waiting out here in hotels and motels that come in from around the world. See, uh, These people here from Ireland and different places waiting for these appointments, but I can't catch it right now. I want to give my time to this. You understand, when I come back off these trips, I usually come back to have, uh, to have uh, someone uh, to minister to because to keep the appointments for right now, we have to let them go because of this. Now, just one thing before we start on this book. At the beginning was a Pentecostal church. That Pentecostal church moved out in the power of the Spirit and wrote a book of Acts. The second round, it began to dwindle. The church had become formal. Second church age, it was real formal, but that little seed of Pentecost kept coming on, the spiritual. Then it went into a place of dark ages of about 1,400 years and something of a dark persecution. That little Pentecostal age kept living on through that. How it survived it, don't ask me. It was the hand of God, the only thing it could have done it, because they pegged them down the post and took the man and turned him over a, a stump and took wooden pegs and drove in their legs and let the animal dogs eat them from the back, pull their intestines through them before they even died. Taking women, cut off their breasts with a snip like that, the right breast and stand and let that blood just flow out till their life would go out of them. Took the babies from the expected mothers and fed them to the dogs and hogs while they were looking at them. Supposing it would be Christianity. But the Bible said and Jesus said it would come to pass that they would kill you thinking they were doing God a service. Yeah. And now that thing creeped down until another age and finally come out. Then we notice as the church become out in the Reformation, it's pulled off and pulled off from that time and got away from the Spirit, got away from the Spirit, right on down until this last age when it's ready to consolidate itself and make an image unto the beast. But that little spirit shall live in the hearts of people until Jesus comes. It's got to be. Bear that in mind. We'll draw it out on the maps. Take the history and everything and show you that it's exactly that way. Let you take the history yourself and read it. See what the Bible said and then what the history said. See how it meets just exactly like that. Oh, may we all not just take this as a lecture, but may we solemnly, solemnly take the warnings of the Holy Spirit and pray day and night. Don't let nothing stop you from praying. We can dig up the lives of those great men back in there, how they sacrificed. You'll see how little you've done. Makes me feel ashamed of myself. Sometimes. How we have to have everything so easy and they had everything so hard. Wandered about, Paul said in Hebrews 11, in sheepskins and goatskins, tormented and afflicted, destitute. Amen. What will our testimony stand up side of theirs? Amen. How will it be up the side of that? We have to have everything so nice. Now, just in respect, before we open the book, I'd like for us all who can just stand for a moment for prayer. Now, with the sincerity of your heart, breathe a word of prayer for, to God. Lord God, the Creator of heavens and earth, the author of everlasting life and the giver of all good and perfect gifts, we would ask you, Lord, first to forgive us of all of our indifferences and our sins and our trespasses against thee 
and against one another and our fellow man. May this little time of coming together not only be for the edifying of our own souls, but may it be to enlighten us in such a way and inspire us that we'll go tell others. May it be a time of rededication, uniting with the full body of Christ and being ready for the rapture. Father God, not by my own feelings, knowing that thy servant and all other servants are insufficient for this great task, realizing how great man gone by has tucked up on their hearts to try to reveal this or to comment upon the great revelation, then we realize that we're more than they are, insufficient. But thou art our sufficiency. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will do something special during this time, that the Holy Spirit will have preeminence in every heart, circumcise the lips that speak and the ears that hear. And when this is all over and we dedicate it to you, may we walk from under the threshold of this house saying it was good for us to be there. The Holy Spirit spoke to us while we were sitting there, and now we are determined to do all we can while the evening lights are shining. Grant it, Lord. May doing this meeting cause men and women to take a hold newly. May you raise up speakers with tongues, interpreter of tongues. May you raise up gifts of prophecy. Raise up preachers, pastors, evangelists, so forth that the church might be edified, raise missionaries to go into the fields yonder and bring forth this glorious gospel. Wherever the word shall go, may it fall into good ground, bringing forth a hundredfold. For we believe that we are at the end of the age. The consummation is near. Grant these things, Father, and above all things, Lord, at this time, help thou me, the needy one. For I ask it as I commit myself to thee for these services in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
mighty God who raised up Jesus from the dead. We are so glad to know that your spirit dwells among us. Hallelujah. Always is he true and never a word of untruth. And now, Father, confirm further thy word as we read for your glory and may every heart, as you have said, be prepared and ready for there will come forth something. Uh, maybe the people will receive their last warning to turn <coughs> from the things that they now do unto the way of right. We thank thee, holy God, in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Turning now to the book of the Revelation, first chapter. Now, the first I want to read the first three verses of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. As I've said before now, in this we're going to try to give a little breakdown now of the book according to the histories and so forth. And each time when you see me referring to pages that I have written here, it's stuff that I have taken from commentaries and so forth. Now, the writer of this book is John, St. John the Divine, wrote to the future generation, A. B, directed to the seven angels of the seven distinct periods of the Christian age, an age from the days of the apostles to the coming of the Lord. And it, now, the ages appear in succession, each one, from the ascension of our Lord to his coming again, each church age is the, described of its spiritual condition. E. Each church age can behold itself by its scriptural and spiritual speaking unto them. As the Spirit speaks, each age can behold itself. Each age bore the true vine of Christ, the wise virgin, and each age bore the grafted vine, the foolish virgin. Historians agree. This is John's life. John lived the last of his years in the city of Ephesus and died there. He was on the Isle of Patmos at the time he wrote the book, Revelation. It was not the story of his life, but the story of Christ in future ages. See, it was a pro prophecy, not the life of John, not the life of Christ, but prophesying of an age to come. It was not his prophetic utterances, but the Lord exaltation solemnly. It was not the revelation of St. John the Divine, but the revelation of Christ the Lord. It is the last book of the New Testament, yet it tells the beginning and the end of the dispensation of the gospel. God, Bible scholars agree the letters to the seven church ages were written prophetically to the future ages. 
Paul wrote of the life and glory of the seven churches present in his day. John wrote of the life and glory of the seven churches in the future. That John was addressing the seven pastors or messengers as direct to all Christians under these seven different angels. Now, the book of Revelations that we're going to take as we break this down for this morning and this evening, and we'll try to let out about 11 o'clock and 11.30, something like that, and then begin again tonight at 7. Now, the contents of this first chapter, the first verse, it, it really speaks for itself because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Second verse, St. John the Divine is the scribe and servant. Third verse, the blessings pronounced. The fourth to the sixth verse, the salute to the church. The seventh verse, the announcements. The eighth verse, the supreme deity of Jesus Christ. The ninth to the twenty verse, the Patmos vision. And also the 14th and 15th verses describes his sevenfold glory of his person. Oh, it's beautiful when we see Christ and his sevenfold personages of his, uh, sevenfold beings of his personages in his glorious resurrection. Now, the title describes the character, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not the revelation of St. John, the divine, but the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, the Greek word for revelation is the apocalypse, which means the unfolding. And I was taking that word and searching it. It means the apocalypse is to, like a sculpture, has made a great statue. And he's got it covered by a veil. And then he goes and tears back this veil and reveals what he has behind the veil. It's an uncovering. And this book is not the uncovering of so much the person of Jesus Christ, yet it certainly speaks of his deity and his sevenfold personage, and also of the things that he is, like priest, king, and so forth. But it is the revealing of the future of his works in his seven church ages that's coming on. It's, when our Lord was on earth, the disciples asked him and said, Master, will you at this time uh, uh, restore the kingdom back to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know this hour or time. And no one would know. He said, even the Son as yet did not know. But after his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension into glory, he received from God the future of the church. Then he returned back to bring this message to the church. And this message of his coming and the condition of his churches down through the age. He could not do it before his death, burial, and resurrection because he had not yet knew it. But did you notice how the scripture reads here? Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him, Christ. How did God the Father gave the revelation to his son Jesus Christ and he sent his angel to John to signify these things which was, which was, which is, and which shall be. Oh, it's set beautifully. Now, in this great uh, coming age that John saw, now these, um, this revelation was given to him strictly to unveil the Pacific purpose of Christ, what he would be and be like in every age. That's the reason I said this morning, keep your mind on the true church. 
The true church began on the day of Pentecost. There's no theologian, Bible scholar, or historian can ever say that it began in the days of Martin Luther, Wesley, Catholic age, or any other age. It began at Pentecost. That was the inauguration of the church. That was the beginning. So therefore, in a discussion with anybody, stand at that gate of Pentecost and they cannot go nowhere else. Just like putting a rabbit in a field. You know wherever a hole is, so you got to stop up, you'll have to come right back to this same place where you come in at. Well, that's the way anyone talking about churches and church ages and works of the Holy Spirit, you'll have to come back to the original beginning. It's got to come back to there because God is infinite and He's omnipotent. Therefore, Him being infinite, He cannot do something here and do something contrary to it. Over here, He's got to do each time like He did it the first time. Like Peter said on the day of when the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, He said, Can we forbid water? seeing that they have received the Holy Ghost like we did at the beginning. Jesus, when he was on earth, spoke and said, "If uh, someone come and said, Is it lawful for us to put away our wives for any cause? Jesus said, uh, He that made male made female for this cause a man shall... He said, But Moses suffered us a writing of divorce. And Jesus said, It wasn't so from the beginning. Go back to the beginning. Therefore, if we're going to talk on the church age, we've got to go back to the beginning, laying aside every statement that any man has made down to the age. This is the most official book of any book in the Bible. This is the only book that Christ put his seal upon. It starts off with a blessing and ends with a curse. Blessing is he that readeth and cursed is he that takes anything out of it. It's the only book that Christ wrote himself of the whole Bible. The Ten Commandments he wrote with his fingers. That's right. Jews held on to that. And today, it's the, the revelation and if Satan hates any book in the Bible, it's the revelation. These two, he hates all Scripture and it's the whole canon of Scripture. But if anything he despises mostly is revelations and Genesis. Because Genesis tells the beginning Revelation reveals what's going to happen to him in the last days. He's going to be bound a thousand years and him, the false prophet, the beast, is going to be thrown alive into the lake of fire. And he'll attack the book of Genesis upon its, its uh, uh, being authentic. He'll say that it isn't authentic. He'll stir the minds of people. Watch where the devil lays. That book of Genesis or the book of Revelation. The first and the last. And the book of Revelations has more symbols in it than all the rest of the books in the Bible. It has more symbols because it is a book of prophecy. It's a prophetic book. Therefore, it has to be understood by a prophetic class. This book is not meant for everybody. There's nobody can understand it hardly. This book is made for a certain class of people. All over Deuteronomy it says, the hidden things belong to the Lord. That is right. And He reveals to us His children the hidden things. So it doesn't go, the carnal mind cannot comprehend them great things of the Scripture because it's foolish to them. But to the ones who are lovers of the Word of God, that's who the book was written to, to the church. The revelation of Jesus Christ to the church at Ephesus, to the church of Smyrna, to the church, to the church. It's all down. The revelation of Jesus Christ to the church. I like that. And notice, it also is the consummation of the Scriptures. The complete consummation. And it's geographically placed at the right place at the end of the Bible. The revelation of the whole thing placed back here with a blessing to who reads it and hears it 
was a curse to them that will add to or take away. It's the complete canon. Oh, the absolute nothing can be added to it. And when a man tries to take anything away from it or add anything to it, God said he'd take the same part out of the book of life. He would take his part from the book if he added to it. Therefore, when we see the manifold revelation of our Lord, who he is, what he is, if any person shall add something to that or take anything away from it, it's a false prophecy. Many have tried to say they had something later than that. But that is the complete revelation of the Lord Jesus in his a church age and in his days. A revelation of our Lord. Now, now unveiling the Greek word. Something that's been hid. Un, un, reveal, uh, revealing Christ. Now, the next verse we find in the second verse, the first verse is unveiling Christ. The revelation or the uncovering. Oh, how the last age and the coming of the Lord was, un, was covered up to the apostles. They asked the question, but only one lived to have the revelation, still he didn't understand it because the history was not yet made. Now, the history of this book, or the, the context of this book, was directed to the seven churches in Asia Minor that then was. It was directed to those seven churches. There were more churches than those seven at that day. But each one of those churches were significant about the characteristic in that church that would follow it down through the age. Amen. The characteristic of that church, like a Ephesus, it had a characteristic. Smyrna, Pergus, and on down, Philadelphia. Each one of those churches had a characteristic in it that would appear again in the ages to come. Oh, if you could only, any man can see the the spiritual application of the scriptures uh, and could say that they wasn't inspired. Hallelujah. Your very actions, the very motives, the very objectives of the people, why, it proves that the scripture is inspired. Amen. To see how God applies those things. Just what you do, here is a type of something like Abraham offering up Isaac, his only son, a type of God giving his son. Hundreds of years later, how that Joseph was sold in, in prison, hated of his brothers, and loved of his father, Jesus, in type. How the Spirit worked through Joseph, a man, and simply typed the life of Christ perfectly. How David, the son of David, sat on the same mountain when David was rejected as king and went up over the hill, Mount of Olives, looking back, weeping as a rejected king. A few hundred years after that, the son of David climbed the same hill as a rejected king and wept over Jerusalem. The spirit and type and form. Oh, then can you see the great Pentecostal church in this last day? Can you see how God inaugurated at the day of Pentecost? That spirit should remain in the church through all ages. They got formal and indifferent. They had to have a denomination. They had to unite church and state together. And they finally did it and caused hundreds of years of persecution. Then the Reformation, they come out in each year. They've been cutting off from the Spirit and adding on to the natural. Off of the Spirit and adding on to the natural until now they're just ready to do it again. Yes, they must. We're living in these last closing hours. The consummation of the church. We are in the Philadelphia or the Lady Ocean Church Age. Oh, God, help. Now, the first chapter, first verse was introduced to, to John. Now, who is the writer? John. John, it was not a revelation of John. And uh, we know that it wasn't because it was the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was, dis he was chosen for a disciple 
And uh, the book itself reveals the thing that it was Jesus Christ to who he was revealing. And it was sent to the... and signified this by his angel unto John. We do not know who the angel was. The Bible doesn't say who the angel was. But we know that it was a prophet. Because the Bible later said that I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify these things which must shortly come to pass. Then we find out that when John started to worship the angel, the angel said, See that you do it not. Revelation 22, I believe it is. And he said, For I am of thy fellow servants and of the prophets. It might have been Elijah. It might have been one of the prophets. John was an apostle. But this prophet was sent. And John being an apostle, look at the nature of the rest of his epistles. Prove that it wasn't John wrote it. Because it has no nature like John. Take First John, Second John, so forth, and read it. And look at the nature of that. Then look at the nature of this. John was a writer and was an apostle, but this is the spirit of a prophet. It's a different person altogether. See? Wasn't John's writing? Wasn't John's revelation? It was God's revelation of Jesus Christ to the churches. And it had, John was just the writer, the scribe. And, um, and the book declares the same. Now, it wasn't addressed to John. It was a addressed to the church. All right. John at that time was the pastor of the uh, Ephesian church. And now the book is addressed to John, or to the church, not to John. Now, the third verse, he announces the blessings. Listen to this. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. What time is at hand? The time these things take place. When this revelation of Jesus Christ is completed in each church age. Now, the reason he wrote it like this if he'd have said, uh, well, now, if, he, there's looking for him to, if it had been revealed, if he, it would have been revealed to John that he was uh, going to come as soon as those churches there was finished, that's the way John thought it. But if it was, them churches, as soon as they was finished, they come, if he knew, if it had been revealed to him, there's going to be seven long church ages, several thousand years or several hundreds of years, then there wouldn't be no reason of waiting. They just live their church age out. Therefore, God spoke it, and it wasn't revealed to them. It wasn't revealed to Martin Luther the things that John Wesley knew about the Scripture. It isn't revealed to the Baptists what the Pentecostals knows about Scripture, because it's in a different age. It's a different time, and God reveals His things just in the season. Oh, you can't plant corn in the springtime and reap at the same time. You plant a seed and it grows to maturity. God plants His Word and then it grows right out. And then we look back and say, there it was. Well, sure. We see it after it's been revealed. Now, blessed. The word, the announcement of the blessing on the third verse. To them that read or hear its mysteries, the carnal mind shuns it because the carnal mind knows nothing about it. No wonder it, the carnal mind doesn't know it. Because it's Satan in that carnal mind and Satan is exposed. And Satan does not want himself exposed. Do you notice how horrible it is for Satan when he thinks he's going to be exposed? Watch him on the services. Watch the action of the people. You watch out on the meeting just before... Satan's going to be exposed over a certain person. You can see their face changing. You see? They don't know what to think. All at once the Holy Spirit comes down and exposes that devil. Oh, he hates that kind of a meeting. That's the reason we've had such a battle. Because the Word of God exposes the devil. See? It tells what he is. Like you say... This woman sitting here, out of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, say, her name is Miss Jones. She come from 
so-and-so. What does that do? It picks up her spirit, brings it up to a place. How do you know me? That man doesn't know me, so it must be some spirit. What kind of spirit is it? It's the spirit of God. How? What's the matter with me? You have tuberculosis, cancer, whatever it is, but thus saith the Lord. Oh, oh, how Satan hates that. Because it exposes him. Now the carnal mind looks on and says, mind reading, mental telepathy. They don't know it's foolish to them. But to those who know what it is, oh, what a blessing. What is it? A revelation. A revelation of who? Of the man on the pulpit? Of Jesus Christ in this last church age, revealing himself like he promised he would do. It's a revelation. See? And Satan hates that. My, how he hates it. He's exposed. Exposes his plans. Satan hates the revelations in Genesis. He got wrote down here. That is exactly true. Now, why does he hate a revelation? Why is he so against revelation? It's because that the entire canon of God's Word and God's church is solemnly built upon revelation. It will never be through a, a school. No matter how many fine seminaries we have, they're way back in the dimmed age. The Bible and the church is absolutely a revelation. Let us turn. I've got some scriptures right here. Uh, Matthew, the, the 16th chapter, and the 18th verse. Let's just take a little look at Matthew 16, 18. See where the scriptures is. Where it's the revelation. Coming down from the mountain. The seventeenth verse, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, or Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the Catholic Church says he built it up on Peter. Well, that, that's really carnal thinking. You couldn't imagine a spiritual mind a comprehending such a thing as that as God with his own son standing there and yet would build his church upon a common, ordinary, sin-born man. The man proved it. He, with that same spirit upon him, he cursed Jesus and denied him right to his face. <coughs> it wasn't Peter. Or neither was it a, a rock that was laying there as some churches claim it was. It was not a rock. Because Peter, the rock that he was speaking about, there was not Peter, neither was it himself. Now, man, the Protestant people try to say it was Jesus. It was him. That he built a church up on he. No, that's still wrong. If you notice, it was not Jesus, neither was it Peter. It was the revelation. Amen. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven Amen. has done this revelation. Look, I want to ask you, in the Garden of Eden, there was no scriptures written. And then the two boys, Cain and Abel, and they both wanted to make a sacrifice and to find favor with God. When they did so, Cain come and built an altar. Abel built an altar. Well, if that's all God requires, God would be unjust to condemn Cain. All right? Then Cain made a sacrifice. So did Abel. Both of them made a sacrifice. Cain worshipped, and so did Abel. Cain did everything that Abel did. So if going to church, belonging to church, making sacrifices, and praying and worshiping God is all God requires, then God would be unjust to condemn Cain for doing exactly what he said to do. But you see, Abel, by a revelation, he knew that it wasn't fruit that brought him out of the Garden of Eden, as many carnal minds think today. Abel come and offered the fruit of the land. And God refused it. But it was revealed. I mean, Cain did. Excuse me. 
Cain offered the fruit of the land because he thought that's what brought him out of the Garden of Eden. What's that revelation? What's the disagreement with it? What's how it hurts today? But it was not fruit that brought him out. Eve never eat those apples. Certainly, how did she realize she was naked? If eating apples, it pertained to the sexual life. Had to. Now, we take that as a study, and we have. Get back in. They haven't got one scripture. Some of them say, well, she said, I got a son from the Lord. Yes, sir, so did the prostitute. God has to make all of us. But it's a perverted life. Look at the nature of that boy. He was of his daddy, the devil. Hatred, mean, murder. See? And then how Abel, when his parents probably told him that it, it, the trees had fruit on it and so forth, but it was revealed to Abel. Yeah. Abel went and got a lamb for blood, Amen. taking life, not a fruit tree, bringing uh, apples and bananas and pears, but Abel, by spiritual revelation, Hebrews 11, <coughs> offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice God testifying of it. Amen. For it was revealed to him by faith. That's where God built his church. For flesh and blood never revealed this to you. You never learned it in a seminary. Somebody ever taught it to you somewhere. But my Father which is in heaven has revealed it to you. Amen. There the whole thing is on revelation. Amen. The whole church upon this rock of revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll build my church. You might take what the pastor says. You might take what the seminary teaches. You might take what the church says. And it's not right yet. You might be able to explain it with eloquence. But until God has revealed to you that Jesus Christ is His Son and you are saved to His blood, upon that revelation that He is my Savior, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell cannot prevail again. So then you see why Satan is so against the book of Revelation. Anything that's revealed, spiritual revelation, Satan's against it. That's why he's so against the ministry today. Because what is it? The revealing of Christ. Let the church go on with its great denominations and organizations and its little fiery messages and so forth. Let them go on. Satan won't bother that. They don't have no troubles. Everybody pats them on the back when it comes a time that God through the Holy Ghost reveals Christ back in the church with a power and demonstration of healing the sick and making the signs that he said would follow the believers come to pass. Then Satan turns over in his bed. He does something about it. Until that time, Satan don't care how much church you join. He don't care how much. But when Christ reveals to you that He is the Son of God and the works that He did, you do also. Not some other works, but the same works. He that believeth in me, St. John 14, 7, He that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he also. Do the same works and greater than this. Because Christ cannot preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but be greater. He cannot bring it to them because the Holy Ghost hadn't yet been given. But when... Jesus came and sacrificed his life and the Holy Ghost returned, then they could impart eternal life to the people. Amen. That's the greater. But the signs and wonders, Jesus plainly said in Mark 16, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How far? All the world. How many? Every creature. As long as the gospel be preached, these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. And when that becomes a revelation... Brother, you're near the kingdom then. On this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell can't prevail against it because the man or the woman that's ever been in that back desert alone like Moses was and the revelation of God be made manifest to him through the Holy Ghost, there's nothing can shake him. He's just as sound and solid as he can be. Satan hates revelation. He don't like it at all. Upsets his plans. The nature of the book shows that John did not write it. That's right. For they are there for other his writing, but not his inspiration. 
It's God's inspiration that writes the book. All right. Let's see what it says now. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, time is at hand what? When the complete revelation of Jesus Christ has been made known to his churches. And as the ages go by, it's just revealed to them. Now, we're right down at the end time. So now we really are at the end of the world. We're at the consummation of the world's history. And before this week's over, and God being with us, helping us, we'll prove that we're at the consummation of the church ages. We're in the Philadelphia, uh, the uh, Lady Ocean church age. The consummation of all ages. With the consummation of the political world. With the consummation of the, of the natural world. We're at the consummation of all things. We're at the end of every natural thing. Ready to enter in. Coming the other day, I believe it was going to Shreveport or coming somewhere. I looked. I said, the trees are dying. The grass is dying. The flowers are dying. I'm dying. The world's are dying. Everything's dying. Everything in this world is dying. We're sitting here this morning dying. Surely there's a world somewhere where everything don't die. If there's one where everything's dying, there's got to be one where everything's living. That's what we're longing for. To get to that place where there's the trees in mortal stands. Amen. Oh, where everything is immortal and it stands in the, in the glory of God. Now, now the first three verses we have had now, laying the background. First, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The second, it was given to John by an angel. And third is blessed. The blessings of them that read. And if you can't read, blessed is he that hears. <laughs> You can't read, you just hear it. That's all. Amen. Blessed is he that readeth, and if you can't read, blessed is he that hears. For the time is at hand. Now imagine what the canon of this means is that John, the writer there, and writing it out was, this is John here just saying blessings and so forth. Now what I think it was, in the Old Testament, the priest stood up of a morning and read the scriptures. The congregation listened Many could not read. So he said, Blessed is he that readeth and he that heareth. Amen. See? The reader and the hearer. The one who reads and hears uh, is blessed. So if you just sit and listen at it, you're blessed. Blessed is he that readeth and he that heareth. For the time is at hand. Now, from four to six is a salute to the church. Now, we're going to take on this fourth and sixth. Now, before we strike it, I want everybody to try to think hard now. What is it now? It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. For God took the veil off of the time. Here's time that Jesus couldn't see when he's here on earth. The church ages. What would take place? So God took the veil away pull it back, and let John look in and see what each church age was going to do and wrote it in a book and sent it to the seven churches. What is it? Christ revealed in the days of his, his action. It's full of action, the book is. And it's a, a prophetic book that Christ has given, God has given to us by his angel, wrote by John, and a blessing to everybody that will read it or hear it read. For the, for the time is at hand when this is all fulfilled. Got a good setting now. And remember, we're keeping the church in mind. Over on uh, one side, the church begins. Over on the other side, the church ends. More into it Monday night when we hit the church ages. John to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Now we're getting into the mysterious and deep parts of the symbol. It's addressed to the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. They had, um, they had uh, the ages at that time was to come in the future. 
And uh, he exalted them and, uh, and praised them for their work and what they'd done. But now it's addressed to them churches, the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor wasn't all of Asia, the continent of Asia. It was just a little part. They claim a place about the size of the uh, state of Pennsylvania, see, or something like that, or Indiana. Just a small place where these seven churches sat. Um, there was more than them churches at the time, and uh, but it revealed their character. And I'm reading here what I got from the uh, reading from the history of it. And uh, he is the uh, cursed is he that heareth and or, and don't listen to it. And um, and now it comes down into the time of this fourth verse that we want to explain something here. From him which was and which is and is to come, and has the seven spirits, from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now the spirits will get to them later. Now here it expresses, if you'll notice in, in there, also in the seventh verse, or the eighth verse, he comes again and said, again expressing, now watch, the seven churches is addressed, from him, which is, which was, and which is to come, which was one time, is now, and which is to come. Now, he expresses here his threefold, uh, uh, his threefold manifestation of his work. Now, if you'll take the eighth verse, we'll come to it just in a minute, but take the eighth verse. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, we're holding the fourth and the sixth verse in view. Both of them are the same. One, he says, to he which was, which is, which is to come. What's he trying to put before the church? His deity. Amen. Today people try to make him a, a prophet. He's more than a prophet. Amen. And some people try to make him three gods. He's not three gods, he's one God. Amen. That lived in three offices, three manifestations Amen. of the same God. Amen. Now remember, this is the revelation. And whosoever heareth it, and don't keep the sayings of this book. His part will be taken from the book of life. Jesus is not revealing himself as three gods, but one God and three offices. Oh, it's going to get rich after a while when we get into those church agents and see where they lost that. It caused a great split at the Nicene Council. Both of them went off on deep ends and they've done the same thing in this last days again. Just like a pre nicene council again. Because there will be another one. Just as certain as I'm standing here, the Catholic and Protestant churches will unite something together or agree with one another. Look at the Archbishop of Canterbury over there now. All that was heaping right up together. And there is not a triune God teaching in the Bible. There's one God. And it's revealed here in the book of Revelations that the whole canon of scriptures might be proven here and Christ set his seal upon it. This is it. If anyone takes away or adds to, the same will be taken out of the book of life for him. So approach this not selfishly. Approach this with an open heart and an open mind. Now, at the Nicene Council... They come to two great decisions on the, oh, many of them in that day of the early church fathers. They had two extreme views. One of them was a triune God, a Trinitarian, and the other was a, a one God. And they both come into a existence and went out on two straight limbs, out like that. The triunity became a place of a three God person. The oneness became a unitarian, just as far wrong as the other one was. 
So they both went on limbs, but right in here reveals the truth. Jesus could not be his own father. Neither if he had a father outside of the Holy Spirit, then he is the illegitimate child and not. The Holy Ghost conceived him and he said God was his father. So the Holy Ghost and God, that's Matthew 1.18. If the Holy Ghost and God has to be the same person or he had two daddies. And he was called Emmanuel, which is God with us. He claimed when he was here on earth that he and the Father was one. I've got all the scriptures written out here. Don't you can find if we had this, this question or something. Now, when he was manifested here as the threefold office of his being, he that was, he that is, he that shall come, the Almighty. Amen. Now, there's no three gods there. There's one God. And in the Nicene Council, to do this and argue this, they had to take a trinity because in the Roman world they had many gods. They prayed to their dad ancestors. Now, I've got the history right here where we can quote it. See? They prayed to their dad ancestors. That's the reason they have St. Cecilia and St. Marcus and St. 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 When Apostle Peter said, there's no other mediator between God and man but that man Christ Jesus. One. They had to have a Trinitarian God, so they, they had Jupiter, Mars, Venus, and it wasn't right to put it all on one God, so they just split it up. And made three full offices of God to be three different gods. But he plainly says you're in the revelation. Who he is? I am he that was. He that is. And he that is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Get it? A little later here he said, I am Alpha and Omega, A to Z, the whole that Greek alphabet. The lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he that was, which is, and shall come, the root and offspring of David. He's God. Amen. God, with 1 Timothy 3, 16, without contradiction, Great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested in flesh, seen of angels, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. God! Not a third person or a prophet, but God Himself made manifest in human form. Now, this is a revelation, remember. Now, God at the beginning was the great Jehovah that lived in a pillar of fire, hung above Israel and led them. That was God, the angel of the covenant. Come down on the mountain, the whole mountain caught fire. Fire flew from the mountain and wrote the Ten Commandments. He was called the fatherhood of God to his children, his chosen race, the people, the Jews. Then that same God was made manifest in a virgin-born body that he created in the wombs of Mary and lived and tabernacled and stretched his tent, as it was, among human beings, and that same God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. The Bible said so. God was in Christ. The body was Jesus. Jesus in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. Can't make him three people now. Don't baptize the three gods. There's one God. One God. Now, this same God was made flesh. He said, I came from God and I go to God. After he had disappeared from the earth by his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, Paul met him on the road down to Damascus when he was yet called Saul. And a voice came and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. And he was a pillar of fire, a light, Amen. that's put out the eyes of the apostles. He had turned back. Amen. The same Jesus had turned back to God the Father again. Amen. That's the reason he said here, I am the Almighty. In the same form he was before he was made flesh. And his body that he lived in called Jesus, the man that we know. Jesus. Now, like a lot of you dear oneness people baptized in the name of Jesus. You're wrong. There's hundreds of Jesuses in the world today. But there's only one Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He was born to Christ. 
Lots of Jesuses. I've met many of them. But there's one Lord Jesus Christ. He's God. And Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is not names. There are titles that go to one name. Say, baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Father's not a name, and Son's not a name, and Holy Ghost is not a name. It's a title, like human. That's what it is, the Holy Ghost, the human, or the Spirit. Holy Ghost. Then say, in the name of the Father. Look at the fathers in your sons, son. Look at the humans in here. See? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is not a name. It's a title that goes to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way the uh, apostolic church baptized in the beginning. And I'll ask anybody to produce one text of Scripture or one time in history that anybody was ever baptized in the Christian church any other way than but in the name of Jesus Christ until the Catholic church was formed and they adopted Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for our creed. Yeah. Now I'll bring up your history, something the historians. There's no such a thing. After 304, A.D. 304, come the triune baptism for a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It's paganism. Before this week is over, I'll read it out of the books and show you by the Bible. We're talking this morning on the Revelation and prove where it come in and how it started to exist. Back to the truth, brother. We're in the last days. Wait till we get that Ephesian church and type with the lady was seeing and look what happened between them. Amen. You'll see how that thing creeps in. Come into the age of Luther. Said you've got a name that you're living but you're dead. The very word Sardis means dead. Amen. They lost it in the 1500 years of dark ages. Every one of them churches kept that to that time. Then when they had the Nicene Council in 606 and then they abolished that name and made three gods out of it. He said here, I'm he that was, he that is, and shall come the Almighty. Amen. Sure, he had a threefold being on the earth. When he was on earth, he was a threefold being. On earth, he was a prophet. He's also in heaven a priest. And when he comes back to the earth again, he'll be a king. Amen. Prophet, priest, and king. Amen. He that was, which is, and shall come. He that was with Jesus, a prophet. He that was now is a priest. Making spiritual sacrifices. Amen. A high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities Amen. and disclose himself and prove that he's in the midst of us. Hallelujah. Prophet, priest, and king, but one God. When he was on earth, he was a prophet. Amen. The Word. The faithful witness, the Bible calls him a little later. A faithful witness is the prophet. He was priest. And when he's priest now, and when he comes, he'll be king. Amen. If you'll get over it, Read Revelation 15.3. You can see in Revelation 15.3. Let's turn over here and see what he, if he's going to be king. If he is king when he comes. Now we're going to... Revelation, the 15th chapter, and the, the uh, third verse. And they sang a song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Amen. Amen. What was he on earth? Prophet. How did the people know he was a prophet? He'd done the sign of the Messiah, which was a prophet. Amen. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. How did they miss him? Because they were looking for something else. Amen. And he'd done the sign of the Messiah, and they wouldn't hear it. He was a prophet. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me. It will come to pass that if they not hear this prophet, they will be cut off amongst the people. He was a prophet on earth. Amen. Now, because he was what? The faithful witness Hallelujah. of God's Word. Amen. Amen. He was God's Word made Amen. manifest. St. John, Amen. the first chapter, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was a true and faithful witness to God's eternal Word. He was the Word. Amen. God's Word. And being the Word, He was a prophet. For the Word of God flowed to Him. It's 
say only the thing. I can do nothing within myself but what the Father shows me to do. Amen. Not me that doeth the works, but the Father that dwells in me, He doeth the works. I and my Father are one. My Father's in me, said Jesus. The man, the tabernacle. God's got many titles. Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Raphael, Manassas. Oh, many. He's got seven compound redemptive names. He's got many titles, Rose of Sharon, Little Little Valley, Morning Star, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all that, but he's got one human name. God only had one name, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was born, Christ the Lord. Eight days later, the Holy Spirit called his name Jesus. His mother had him circumcised and called him Jesus. He was born to Christ like I was born to Branham. I was a Branham when I was born and given the name of William. Amen. And he was born Christ the Savior, and when he was eight days old, he was given the name of Jesus, and he was the Lord of glory made manifest, so he is the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of glory made manifest among us. Amen. Oh, there he is. On earth he was a prophet, and glory he's a priest, coming he's a king. Oh, I like that. Prophet, faithful witness of the word. Priest with his own blood before God. King. King of saints. Not king of the world. He's king of saints. We have earthly kings more than people. But we have a king too in a kingdom. That's the reason we act different. Like I said not long ago about my wife. We was going to the store up here and we seen a miracle almost. In the summertime a woman had on a dress. And I said, that's a strange thing. I said, if I had my camera, I'd take the lady's picture. See? Because we had this first woman, we seen with a skirt on, you know, dressed like a lady ought to be. All of them. She said, well, why is it, Bill, that our people uh, 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 dress, uh, we're, we're commanded? I said, it's not uh, our people, it's God's people. God's people requires holiness. Right. said, well, don't they go to church? I said, there's a lady right there sings in a choir at a certain church here. Well, then why that? I said, because she isn't taught any different. That's right. That's exactly right. That's that church carnal we'll get into this week. Church spiritual, church carnal. They're all drifting right back to the man churches. church. As the Bible said in Revelation 17, they would do it. Amen. Amen. They're returning back right now. All of them. Acting like it. Organizing. Well, we are certain. We organize. We're this and we're that. It wasn't so at the beginning. Taking all the power out of the church and putting it on a bishop or a pope. God's in his church among his people. Amen. Manifesting Amen. himself through the laity and everywhere. Hallelujah. Now, but in this day... She said, well, aren't we Americans? I said, no. We live here, but we're not Americans. We are Christians. Our kingdom is of above. And if our lives come from up there, then we act like that. Because we come, our life is from a holy place. It looks different. It dresses different. The women up there have long hair, and they don't wear manicure on their faces. And they don't wear shorts. They, they wear skirts and uh, long robes and dresses. And they have long hair and things. So the, the nature of it from up there reflects back on us. The man don't smoke, chew, lie, steal. They come, their spirits come from a holy place, makes them act holy. Recognize one another as brothers. That's it. We're of a kingdom and we have a king. And he's the king of saints. And the word saint comes from the word of the sanctified ones. Then when a person is sanctified, Christ, the Holy Spirit, moves into the heart and becomes Amen. king over that. Oh, my! That ought to go home. Oh, when the sanctified vessel of God, Christ the King, the Holy Ghost, moves in, and he, a king has his domain. Hallelujah. Amen. If your whole being yes. is ruled by the king Hallelujah. of saints, a kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Every kingdom on earth will be shook, Hallelujah. tore down by atomic power. But the Bible says we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Hallelujah. King of saints. Thank you, Lord. I want you to notice the symbols of Christ also. In the Bible and here on earth, on the earth he was a prophet. you believe that? Amen. A prophet is the word. We know that. The word prophet means a divine interpreter of the word. The divine word is wrote, and the prophet has the divine spirit of God within him. And you know, the prophet in the Old Testament is called God. How many knew that? 
Jesus said, if they call them gods, is it written your law, they are your gods? Amen. And if they call them gods who the word of God came to, the prophet, how will you condemn me when I say I'm the son of God? Amen. Because he was called God because he packed within him the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Therefore the word prophet means a, his, his interpretation isn't to be mingled with. See? If the God, he says, if there be one among you who is spiritually a prophet, I, the Lord, will speak to him. What he says comes to pass, and hear him because I'm with him. Amen. But if it doesn't come to pass, then don't hear him, I haven't seen him. That's the way you know it. And then you see the divine interpretation of the word has to coincide with this last revelation to the church. Amen. He's God, Amen. the Almighty. On earth he was a prophet, which is the eagle. How I many know that a prophet is considered an eagle? An eagle is the strongest bird we got, most powerful. Some of their wings stretch 14 feet from tip to tip. He can take and fly so high that if any other bird try to follow him, he'd disintegrate. <laughs> Feathers would fall out of him and he'd come apart. <laughs> because why? He's built special. And what good does it do him to get up that high if he can't see what he's doing when he's up there? Talk about a hawk eye, you'll see eagle eye. <laughs> a hawk can might see a chicken. That's right. That's what's the matter with some of these hawks today. <laughs> but I tell you, an eagle goes so if a hawk tried to follow him, he'd die. He'd suffocate. Yeah. He can't get into those spheres that the eagle does. And then he's got an eye that he can see so far. And he's got up there. So that's the reason God called his prophets eagles. He gets up there and he's an eagle. He can see well. And Christ on earth was an eagle. When he died, he was a priest. So that made him a lamb. Is that right? And when he comes again, he's king, so he'll be a lion. Amen. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. He is a eagle, a lamb, and a lion. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Prophet, priest, and king. He that was, which is, and shall come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega from the beginning to the end. The eternal God. I want to ask you, some of you precious Catholic people, who call that the eternal sonship of God. God, eternal sonship of Jesus Christ with God. How can you say such a word? I'm a dummy with a seventh grade education. But I know better than that. The word son has to have a beginning. So how can he be eternal and be a son? Amen. Eternity has no beginning or end. So he can't be a son, an eternal son, and then have a beginning. Because there is no such a thing as the eternal son. A son had a beginning, so he can't be eternal. You see, he is the eternal God, not the eternal son. Sorry. Almighty. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, made manifest in flesh. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And on the day of Pentecost, when that pillar of fire came down over the people, did you notice it separated itself? And tongues of fire set upon each one of them. Fire like tongues, setting on each one. What was God doing? Separating himself into the church among each one. Giving the women, the man, and all of the parts of his spirit, dividing himself among his church. How can a man come along and say, The holy man is the Pope, the holy man is the bishop? Amen. The holy man is Christ! Amen. The Holy Spirit in us. How can you say the laity has no word to say? Each one of you has something to say. Each one of you's got a work to do. Amen. Each one of you's got to carry a message. Amen. Glory! The Holy Ghost separated itself on the day of Pentecost. God separated himself. That day you'll know that I am in the Father, the Father in me, I and you and you and me. Amen. That day, the Holy Spirit over all, in all, Hallelujah. through all. Amen. Amen. There is the Holy Spirit has a right to move anywhere that he wants to upon anybody he wants to. You don't have to take what some bishop or some priest says. He's our only priest. Amen. Right. A high priest. Now, prophet, priest, and king. Now, and Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, 
the first begotten of the dead, again, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The word wash there, actually in the Greek, means to loose. He loosed us from our... We were tied to the earth by our sins. We couldn't see, couldn't hear, had no conception of heaven or nothing. But when the blood came down, it cut the line. And we got loosed. <laughs> I read a story one time. It's, uh, may it fit in good right here. A farmer caught a crow, and he tied him. And he said, I'll teach the other crows a lesson. So he tied the old crow and by a leg with a string, and the poor old thing like starved to death. He's so weak he could hardly walk around. That's what some of these organizations and churches has tied the people down. Just can't, well, this is all far you can go. Days of miracles is past. You're just tired, that's all. There is no such thing as the Holy Ghost. He don't speak in tongues like he used to. He's God. He's just the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews says today. Living in all the churches. We'll get to it after the setting of this morning. He's God that lives in every church age. He will live in every church age and live in his people for eternity. For we have now within us eternal life. So this denomination had tied him down. See, well, the days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing as divine healing. A poor old fellow hobbled along till he was so poor he could hardly walk. And one day there was a good man come by. And he said, you know, that poor old crow, I feel so sorry for him. After all, he might have been getting his corn. That's the only way he makes a living. He's got to have something to eat. So he didn't know any difference. He's just out there getting corn. <laughs> so if, then he took, his, he took his knife and cut the old crow loose. And he know, here come the other crows coming over and said, Come on, Johnny Crow, let's go south. Cold weather's are coming. You know what? That crow would just go as far as he could go out there. He said, I can't do it. <laughs> it's, not, it's just not far us in the state. <laughs> we, we just can't do it, see? He had been tied so long until he thought he was still tied. <laughs> and that's where a lot of people, you're tied down with creeds and denominations from the old mother prostitute back there telling you that Jesus Christ isn't the same. There's no such a thing as healing. There's no baptism of the Holy Ghost. There's none of this stuff like that. Trying to tell you that you've been tied so long till you still think you're tied. The good man Christ gave his blood that he might wash us and loose us from our sin. Yeah. What is sin? I'll ask anybody to tell me what is sin. Sin is unbelief. Yeah. That's right. He that believeth not is condemned already. Yeah. And your sin is your only thing that keeps you from being free is because God cuts you loose from your unbelief, but you're so bound with creed until you still think you're tied to starving to death. He's hobbling around. I'm Presbyterian. I'm Methodist. I'm Baptist. You tell me I'm Church of Christ. The days of miracles is past. There's no such thing. You poor starved crow. <laughs> Why don't you come along this morning? Why don't you fly away? Hallelujah. Rise up with the wings of the morning and fly away to the soul of righteousness with healing in his wings. That's it, brother and sister. Oh, he who the Son has cut free is free indeed. Amen. Yes, sir. Well, my pastor, nothing about that. The Bible said you're free. That's right. You're free. My church, well, get cut loose, has washed us and loosed us from our denominations in his own blood. And it's made us free so we can think for ourselves and do for ourselves and talk for ourselves and act for ourselves. Well, if I went back and told the pastor I had to be rebaptized, he would, what about you're free? This is a revelation. <laughs> All right, you're free. If you've been sprinkled with a little salt shake like this in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, there's a pool sitting here ready to smell with water in it. See? Yes, sir. It's not right. So you're not bound anymore. You're free, but maybe you don't know it. But let me tell you this morning, the Bible said He loosed us from our sins, our unbelief, that we might receive the revelation Amen. of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go away free. Have to take what any church says about it. Take what God said about it. Here's His revelation revealing who He is. I always believe that God the Father had a long white beard, white hair, and the son was a middle-aged man, and the Holy Ghost was a mascot boy. Brother, that's paganism. That's pagan. Do you believe in three gods? The very first commandment, what is the first commandment? Hear ye, O Israel, I'm the Lord your God, one God. That's it, he's one God. Not three gods. He lived in three offices, served three places. He's prophet, priest, and king. He's eagle, lamb, and, and lion. He's the lily of the valley, rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, and morning star. 
the root and offspring of David. He's from A to Z. He's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He's all that, but he's one. He's one God. That's his titles that goes to him. But there's one God. Never was anybody, any page of the Bible or in history until the Catholic Church was ever baptized by immersing in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. If you show me the page or anything, you write it laid up over here with me tonight, and I'll walk out of this church saying, I am a hypocrite. I have taught people wrong. If you can show me one text of Scripture or bring me one history, authentic history, that will show me that were that people ever baptized in the Bible in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Or bring me one script or one uh, uh, book of history, one page, one quotation in history where anybody was ever baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost until the Nicene Council of the Catholic Church. Come bring it to me. I'll pin a sign on my back and walk through Jeffersonville and you behind with a horn blowing. I'll put on there a false prophet misleading the people. Pastor, if you're here this morning and do that, you ought to let me do that to you. Now, what is it? This is the revelation. This is the revelation. And this is the Holy Spirit, Christ sending His message to the churches. Hear it. Hear it. That's what the Bible teaches. Where did it come in at? If you just won't get angry and move away through the week, you, you get the Nicene Council. Uh, get the hostages to Babylon. Get now Josephus. Uh, history is all right, but he only wrote one paragraph of Christ. Said there was a man named Jesus who ran and healed the people, and, and he died, or Pilate killed him, and and uh, or Herod or put him to death, and then the disciples went and stole his body away and hid it out in the each night to go and cut a piece off of it and eat it. So they were cannibals. So it was taking communion. You see, the carnal mind. Josephus is no one to listen to, but take the Fox Book of the Martyrs. There's a good authentic. Fox Book of Martyrs. How many ever read it? Uh, the Pemberman's Early Ages, or, or Hossus Two Babylon's, or, or some great authentic, or the, the most greatest we have is the Nicene Council. The pre-Nicene Council and the Nicene Council. You find out there that was never mentioned. No persons. Take the Holy Scriptures and see if there ever was anybody in the Bible ever baptized using those titles named Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It denotes three gods. It's for a pagan ceremony. And Catholicism is nothing else in the world but a, a pagan form of Christianity. And from the Catholic Church come Martin Luther, John Wesley, Baptist, Presbyterians, and so forth. But in the last days, it was a door set between there that opened up the truth again that the Bible said so. And the great prophet was to come on the earth in the last days. We believe he's coming. Watch and he'll have a church. Now, we'll see this. Now, now, remember, this is the revelation you cannot take from it. Now, what a challenge. Find one person in the Bible, one place they ever baptized anybody in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Or ever sprinkled anybody. Find that in the Bible for the remission of their sins. They never. And every person, no matter how they was baptized, had to come and be baptized over again in the name of Jesus Christ That's to get right. the Holy Ghost. Amen. Acts 19, Paul passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, signed certain disciples. He said, disciples, they're having a great meeting. They were following a man by the name of Apollos, who was a converted lawyer, a Baptist, who believed on John the Baptist and was proven by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Paul passed through and seen Aquila and Priscilla in the 18th chapter of of the Acts, and then he went over to have a dinner or something other with Aquila and Priscilla. They told him about this great man. They went to hear him. He listened at him that night. He said, he's very well. That's very fine. That's good. But said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? What about you poor Baptists back there believe you received the Holy Ghost when you believe? He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Someone said that wasn't written in that. I defy that. I've got the authentic Greek right here, Hebrew Jew. The Bible says in the Greek and both Hebrew and also in the Aramaic, yeah. all three of them, I got them right here, that said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Yeah. That's right. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Yeah. Now, he said, we not know where there would be any Holy Ghost then. He said, until what was you baptized? Yeah. They said, we've already been baptized for the man that baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been baptized under John's baptism, the same holy water perhaps, the same man. Paul said that won't work. He only baptized unto repentance, not for remission of sins. 
Now, some of you oneness people come around and, and baptize that wrong. You baptize that unto, for salvation. Water don't save a man. It's the blood. Yeah. Repentance. Not through baptism, through regeneration. No, sir. Regeneration comes by the Spirit. Baptism is an is a outward expression of the inward work of regeneration has been done. See? All right. Notice. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He said, he said we don't know where there be any Holy Ghost. He said, how was you baptized? said, we've been baptized unto John. He said, John barely baptized unto repentance. Unto repentance. Saying if you should believe on him, the lamb, the sacrifice was to come on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were rebaptized Amen. again. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues and prophesied. Uh, Tell me that's not scripture. And show me any word anybody has ever baptized any other way in the New Testament but the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Show me St. Anthony, but so many of the others who were baptized on down until the time of the, of, the, of the Nicene Council. And every one of them was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And the missionaries filled the field with the name of Jesus Christ. But when the Nicene Council came, they had to have three gods. They took down Paul, or took down Juniper and put up Paul. They took down Venus and put up Mary. They had all kinds of gods, all kinds of saints and everything else. They made a triune baptism and fed it to the Protestants. Amen. And they still got up it down, but the evening lights has come now. Amen. The prophet said, it'll be light in the evening time. It'll be light in the evening time. The path to glory you will surely find in the waterway. That's the light today. Buried in the precious name of Jesus, young and old, repent of all your sins. The Holy Ghost will surely enter in. The evening lights have come. It is the fact that God and Christ are one. Amen. You believe it? Amen. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Let this be known to you, the house of Israel, that God's made this same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. 16th verse of the second chapter. Yes, God's made this same Jesus who crucified both Lord and Christ. That all the house of Israel know surely. Talked to a Jew not long ago at a, up here at the house of David. He said, you Gentiles can't cut God in three parts and give him to a Jew. We know better than that. I said, that's just it, Rabbi. We don't cut God in no three parts. I said, you believe the prophets? He said, certainly. I said, um, um, do you believe Isaiah 9, 6? He said, yes. I said, who is the prophet speaking of? Messiah. I said, what relation will Messiah be to God? He said, he will be God. I said, that's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> See, there you are. So you can't cut him in three parts. If you missionaries here, one's going here to the Jews. I mean, this man sitting here. Well, she never tried to give God, uh, the Jew no father, son, holy ghost. He'll tell you right quick, he know where it come from, the Nicene Council. He won't listen to that. But you let him see where the God was made flesh, and he is the only God there is. Yeah. God made flesh in human form and lived among us to sanctify us. Take away that he himself might come in the form of the Holy Ghost. God the Father, Holy Ghost, is the same person. The Bible said in, in the genealogies of Jesus Christ in the first chapter of Matthew, it said, uh, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, on down, said, and then, uh, uh, and uh, let me read it now, or you know this what I'm talking about. Matthew, the first chapter. And we'll... Now, let's begin at the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with the child of God the Father. Does that read that way? Uh, found of the child with who? The Holy Ghost. I thought God the Father was his father. Thank God the Father and the Holy Ghost is the same spirit who had two fathers. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willingly to make her public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not taking thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the God the Father, huh? the Holy Ghost. Then who was the Father of Jesus Christ? The Holy Ghost. What is that in you? Well, that's God the Father too, isn't it? Sure. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name. Jesus. Here's God the Father, here's God the Holy Ghost, and here's God the Son. See? Now, three gods. The Bible don't say this two has to be the same, or he had two fathers. See? He can't have two fathers, you know that. Now, she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, this is all done, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, A virgin shall 
be with child and shall bring forth the son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is by interpretation, God with us. That's the first chapter of Matthew, Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus said, go baptize in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. What is the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost? Jesus Christ, of course. You read a love story, said John and Mary lived happy ever after. Who is John and Mary? Go back to the first story and find out. If there's no such a thing, no name, Father, or Son, or Holy Ghost, then who, whose name is it? Go back to the first story and see who he's talking about. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, Repent, every one of you, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He had the revelation. John had the revelation. Jesus was the revelation. He has produced himself right here in the Scripture. I am he that was, which is, and shall come, the Almighty. Never. All right. Now. Let's get the seventh verse right quick now before we get out as quick as we can. The Almighty, dominion, glory and dominion forever and ever. Oh, man. He made us kings and priests unto God his Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See that revelation there? How is it revealed how God, men scratch your heads and pull their hair and things trying to find out what Father, Son, Holy Ghost is. Make three of one. Don't pull your hair and scratch your head. Just look up. Revelation comes from above. <coughs> That's right. You reveal it's no Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's three offices that one God lived in. He was in the office spirit by himself because the human being is condescending. Then he made himself a body and lived in it to produce his own blood, not through sexual like it was in the Garden of Eden, but produce a creative body. And through that virgin born body, he gave a blood that sanctified us and loosed us from our unbelief to believe on him. Then we do that, we receive Him into our heart, and that's God in us. God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. See? Yeah, this is prophet, priest, and king. And the same thing. All right. Now the seventh verse. This is the announcement. The announcement is, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and ever I shall see Him. They also which pierced Him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Oh, how much time we got. That's beautiful there. Could you spare another thir- 20 minutes? Yeah. Could you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, then tomorrow, tonight we'll try to catch the rest of the Patmos vision. Tonight, right. today we're going to end on the announcement. Oh, you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. You love this old Bible? Yeah. It is a revelation. What? What is it? God reaches down in this book and takes the veil off. So there he is, prophet. Priest, King, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, He that was, which is, and shall come, all these things. It is God. Now, let's take the veil off just for a few minutes now, the Lord helping us. Take the veil from our eyes and get, Behold, He cometh with clouds. Now, how is He coming? With clouds. What kind of clouds? Clouds of glory. Not one of these thunderheads, rain clouds. The clouds of glory. You watch what kind of a cloud he is enshrouded in when Peter and them saw his vision on Mount Transfiguration. A cloud overshadowed him. His rim had shined. He was enshrouded with a cloud. The power of God. Oh, we get to that over here in these church ages. I'm telling you, it just, it just tickles my innermost beings to think of it. What he's coming. I see this day that where we're living, where nothing, no hopes left, but his coming. Now, we'll quickly get this. Now, remember, every eye shall see him. Now, that wasn't the rapture then, was it? It wasn't the rapture. It wasn't the rapture. What was he speaking to? The second coming. And they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now, we'll go back and get some history. Let's go back to Zechariah. And get the twelfth chapter of Zechariah. Zechariah. All right. And the Lord added to the church daily such as would be saved. How thankful we are for the good revelation of Jesus Christ. Aren't you happy for Him? Now, we will get this in book form just as quick as we possibly can to the people and then you can have it uh, to read it in a quieter room and things and study it out yourself. Uh, all right. Zachariah. The uh, 
Zechariah, the twelfth chapter now, of Zechariah, and we won't take this real prayerfully now, and I want to get this for the glory of God. Now, Zechariah 12, let's begin at the ninth verse. Listen close now. He's speaking of the coming. Zechariah 12, and we begin at the ninth, the ninth verse. And it shall come to pass, Zechariah prophesying 487 years before the coming of Christ, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. Think of it. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, when's the gospel returning to the Jews? When the day of the Gentile is finished. The gospel is ready to go to the Jews. Oh, I could, if I could just foretell you a little something, it's fixing to happen right here. See? Right in this day. See? It's fixing to happen. We get in the church age. And this great thing that's fixing to happen will carry over to Revelation 11 and pick up those two prophets, Elijah and Moses, returning back again for the Jews. We're ready for it. Everything's set in order. Just ready, this Gentile message, as the Jews brought it to the Gentiles, the Gentiles will take it right back to the Jews again. And the rapture will come. Now remember, this here coming after the tribulation, the church does not go through the tribulation. We know that. The Bible says so. All right. Now you pour out upon the house of Israel. What? The same Holy Spirit. See? After the Gentile church is gone. And they look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And in that day shall there be great mourning in Jerusalem, and mourning and, and the valley of Midio, and, uh, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart in the family of the house of Nathan apart and each one of the houses apart when they see what will happen what will take place when he comes in the clouds of glory at his second appearing and when those Jews who pierced him you know another scripture says they'll ask him where did he get these wounds he said in the house of my friend and not only will it be a mournful time for the Jews who rejected him as Messiah, but it'll be a mournful time for them left Gentiles back here who has accepted, who has rejected him as their Messiah of this age. They'll be wailing and weeping. The sleeping virgin will be wailing. That's that church that refused to get oil in its life. There were ten virgins went out, all good people, but five of them had oil in their lamps. The other five were good people, good. People, but failed to get oil in their land. And they were cast out into outer darkness where they'd be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Here it is. They'll be wailing. The Bible says here. They'll be wailing and so broken hearted until even... Here, I'll give you another Genesis 45. If you want to get to that, let's get to it just a moment and read that also in Genesis, the, I believe the 45th chapter of Genesis. I'd uh, like to get this here. Joseph making himself known to his to his people. And we'll get this, just show the, the types of what will take place in that day. And then we'll bind it together. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before them that stood by him. And he cried, called every man to go from me. Now remember, Joseph, making himself known, he cried, every man go from before me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard him. He must have screamed out. Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brother could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brethren, who you who you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves that you have sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Oh, how beautiful. 
for these two years has famine been in the land, and in which shall be uh, there shall be neither be ear nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posture in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Let me just take now and compare that with Zechariah the twelfth just for a moment. Now, we know that in type, if you teach types, then you always get it right, I think, in, in type. Now, Joseph, when he was born, he was hated by his brethren. Is that right? Now, I want to show you, Joseph represents the Spirit-filled church. Joseph was hated of his brethren. Why? Because he was spiritual. Joseph could not help because he could see vision. He could not help because he dreamed dreams. See? Uh, and could interpret dreams. He, that was what was in him. He could not display anything else but what that was in him. Well, then his brothers hated him without a cause. But his father loved him because his father was a prophet. See how it was with Jesus? God loved his son, but the brethren, the Pharisees and Sadducees, hated him because he could heal the sick and foretell things and see visions and interpret. See what I mean? They hated him without a cause. And what did they do to Joseph? They pretended he was dead and they threw him into a ditch. Took a bloody coat of seven colors that his father, there's only seven colors in the rainbow, and the rainbow, we know what, we get to it a little later, I think, tonight. The rainbow over him here, Jesus, where he's looked upon as jasper and star of stone and a rainbow. Rainbow's a covenant. And that was God's covenant upon Joseph. And then they blow it on his coat and tuck it back to the father and he's supposed to be his dad. And, but he was raised up out of the ditch and was put into a, a sold to Pharaoh some in Egypt and a, a general kept him. And when they did, he uh, ill thing come up against him and throw him in jail. And there he prophesied and told two men where one would go and where the other would go, the butler and the, and the baker, on account of their dream. And then... He was exalted from there to the right hand of Pharaoh. And no man could touch Pharaoh only through Joseph. Watch this. Now the, when Joseph then was sold over into the Egyptians and watched everything he done type Christ. Look at this butler and this baker in there. And they both had dreams. And Jesus, when he was in his prison house, remember Joseph was in prison. And when Jesus was in his prison house, hacked to a cross. There was one saved and one lost. Joseph, when he was in his prison, one was saved, one was lost. I notice, then after Jesus was taken off the cross, he was exalted into heaven and set at the right hand of the great spirit Jehovah. And no man can come to God except by me. No hail Mary, no blessed this or blessed that. But through Jesus Christ, the only mediator in the history of God and man. Amen. That precious body that God tabernacled in among us, that took God's name, and God took the name of humans. God took, look here in the beginning. When Adam, I just take it away from that, seems like somebody's not getting it somewhere. Look, in the beginning, let me show you something again. The Holy Spirit warns me to do this. I'm leaving my subject for a minute. When the first news come to glory, that the son had been lost, Adam, did God send an angel? Did He send a son? Did He send anyone else? He came Himself to redeem His lost son. Amen. Hallelujah! God didn't trust it with no one but Himself. God was made flesh and dwelt among us and redeemed man Himself. It's a, we are saved, the Bible says, by the blood of God. Amen. The mortal God was, the immortal God was made mortal in order to take away sin to be the Lamb Himself. To enter into glory, veiled and with the own blood before Him, beyond the veil. Now, Joseph, down in the Egypt, he goes, and there he was exalted from his prison to the right hand of Pharaoh, and was made the caretaker, and everything prospered in the days of Joseph. Now when Jesus returns, even the desert shall blossom like a rose. Hallelujah. He is the son of prosperity. Type of Joseph. They put Joseph in, uh, the general had him in his house, everything he done, he prospered. 
They put him in jail, and the whole jail prospered. <laughs> everything they done, he prospered. And when he exalted the highest of Pharaoh next to Pharaoh, everything in Egypt prospered above anything in the world. When he returns, it'll be a land of prosperity. The old deserts will blossom, and there'll be food everywhere. And we can everyone sit on our own fig tree and laugh and rejoice and live forever. In his presence, when he comes back as king, he was son of man, prophet. Amen. He was son of man, sacrifice, priest. He's son of man as king, the son of David, sitting on the throne of his majesty. Son of man. He's met God manifested as son of man. He come down and become man to take sins away from the world. He become man as a prophet. He become man as a priest. He become man as king. King of heaven, king of saints. The eternal king. Always was king. Always will be king. Eternal king. Now, notice. Then Joseph, before Joseph went forth, they had to sound the trumpet first. And people screamed, bow the knee for Joseph. No matter what a man was doing, he was selling a product on the street. When that trumpet sounded, he bowed his knee. (laughs) A man was just not ready to reach out and get his money, but he bowed his knee. Joseph was coming. Oh, the, the, the... the Munich was just about ready to make his act. And what he did, he had to stop. Joseph is coming. <laughs> the trumpet sounded. One of these days, everything, even time, will stand still. When the trumpet of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and the morning great eternal right and bear. Everything will bow to thee. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to it. Start now. Some man's sins go before, some follow. But now notice what's taking place. How glorious. When Joseph then, after he married a Gentile and received a family, Ephraim and Manasseh's his son. Did you notice at the end when Joseph, Jacob started to bless Ephraim and Manasseh? When he started to put his hands, he put Ephraim on the right, Manasseh's on the left to get the right hand blessing, the oldest. But when he started to pray, his hands crossed. And he gave the youngest one the right hand blessing instead of the one that was on the right hand. And Joseph said, Not so, Father. Said, You have put the blessing on Manasseh instead of on Ephraim. And he said, God has crossed my hands. What? From the Jews, the oldest, the first chosen of God, through the cross. Come the blessing back to the Gentiles to get the bride. The blessing come to the cross. From the Jew to the Gentile. Rejected. They rejected the cross. Therefore, he got the Gentile bride. Now, when Joseph before this, when he was heard of his brethren who they had been out of fellowship for many years, the Jew. Now watch, we're getting back to Zechariah now. Well, they wail and mourn and wail and even families will separate themselves from other families. Well, said, how did we do it? How could we have ever done it? Well, they say, where'd you get them scars? Them prints in your hands, even those that pierced him. He'll come in the clouds and they'll see him. Even those who pierced him in every house will mourn and they'll wail. They won't know what to do. And with Joseph, you know the story. When he seen his brethren and he make out like he couldn't speak Hebrew, he got the interpreter to interpret for him. And he couldn't speak Hebrew, he act like. But he wanted to find out. And when finally, one day when they brought his little brother, did you notice it was Benjamin that set Joseph's soul afire? What is it today that's going to set his soul afire? Our Joseph Jesus, that young church has been down in Iran, now has kept the commandments of God. And the newborn people is gathered into Palestine and restored back to Jesus. That six point star gave the oldest flag in the world. A nation has been born in the last few years. There's Israel. Nations are breaking. Israel awakening. The signs that the Bible foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors and cumbers. Return, O dispersed to your own. The day of redemption.
redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Look at the Bible on the right. Be filled with the Spirit, your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. Hallelujah. All prophets are lying, God's truth they're denying, that Jesus the Christ is our God. Amen. Glory! But the revelations come! Hallelujah! Oh, we'll walk where the apostles have trod. Right in that same place! For the day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with God's Spirit, your lamp trimmed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. Oh, Joseph, when he see little Benjamin standing there, that's his little brother. You see little Benjamin out there, we are, sitting over there. The tribes of the earth of the Jews returned back there where there'd be 144,000 sent there to receive Christ when they see him coming. They'll say, oh, this is our God who we've waited on. Then they'll see the pierce. Where did these come? He said, in the house of my friend. And they'll wail and they'll cry. And each family, the tribes of David and Nephilim and all will separate themselves. Each family and weep to themselves when they see him stand in the air. The one they pierced. What will his message be? Watch what Joseph said. When he said, watch another thing. When Joseph got the children before him, he looked at him, he seen little Benjamin, he seen Ephraim, he seen the rest of them there, the uh, Gad and all of them, and the, the twelve tribes, the ten tribes then, standing before him. He seen them all stand there. He knew they were his brethren, and he looked at little Benjamin, directly his throat began to fill out. He knew that was his! What did he say? Let every man leave me. What happened to his wife and children? They went into the palace. Where will the Gentile church go at the rapture? Into the palace. The bride. Hallelujah. The bride will be taken off the earth in the rapture. Then when he returns, his bride is in there when he makes himself known to his brethren. The Jews, those who pierced him, those who rejected him, but his wife and his love and his close friends there, his, his own God-sent companions as in the temple. And when he looked, he said, they, were, they didn't know, they said, oh, this great prince, they began to uh, say one to another oh, about these things and what they had done. I believe it was Ephraim, or not Ephraim, but uh, I forget which one it was now that it, uh, said, well, uh, we ought not to have killed our brother, Joseph. Said, you see, we're getting paid back. Reuben. Reuben said, we ought not to have killed our brother. Said, because, you see, we're getting paid back for what we've done. And Joseph said, I didn't think he could understand Hebrew. <laughs> but he noticed. <laughs> Some things can't understand speaking in tongues, but he knows all about it. And he knows. The Gentile kingdom come in with speaking in tongues and interpretations. In the head of gold. The first head before it fell, what ended that first Gentile dispensation? A handwriting of unknown tongues on the wall, and a man there could interpret it and tell what it was. Amen. It goes out the same way. Amen. Amen. Entered in and it goes out the same way. They thought he couldn't understand them tongues that he's speaking, but he knew it. They said, you see what we got? And Joseph then seen their sorry for what they had done. Now he sees their sorrow and regret for rejecting him. So he's choking up in his throat now. He's ready to dismiss his church from the earth. Take her into glory. Amen. Then return and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. What did they do? Reuben. All of them began to cry. They said, oh, oh, they feared. They said, this is him. Now we know we're in for it. Now he will kill us. Now he, we know that we're going to be destroyed right now because that is Joseph that's been away from us so long. That's Joseph, our brother. Now we're really in for it. He said, don't be angry with yourself. God did this to preserve life. Amen. What did God do? Why did the Jews reject Jesus? So that we Gentiles, Amen. so that the people that he called out for his name's sake, God did it to preserve the life of the Gentile church. Amen. Right. All the 
tribes who rejected him will mourn. They'll hide themselves in dens and rocks and things. They hide all over the mountains. They rejected him. All the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And each family in Israel there will separate themselves. Families will separate one from the other and say, Why did we do it? How did we come to reject him? How? There he stands. There's a God who we waited for. And there he is with nail prints in his hands. And we did it. That's exactly what them brothers said right down there. When they come back and said, There's Joseph who we sold. He said, I'm Joseph, your brother, who you sold into Egypt. Oh, they were scared and they were mourning and wailing and run to one another. What can we do? He said, don't be angry with yourselves because God did this all. God sent me ahead. God created all men. White man, black man, brown man, yellow man, every man. God created every man. He created the Gentile, created the Jews. He created all. It's all for his glory. And the Jews had to be rejected in order to take a Gentile bride. That's what all these types are. So the Gentile bride and her offsprings with her, that glorious Pentecostal church washed in the blood of the Lamb with all the power of the resurrection living in them, will rise someday in the rapture in a moment in a twinkling of an eye to go be in the presence of Jesus while he returns back and dismisses everything to make himself known to his brethren. Watch what the scripture says here in closing. Oh, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and ever I shall see. Now he's talking about the second coming, not the rapture. And they also which pierced him. The seventh chapter, the first, or, uh, seventh verse of this first chapter. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Then he gives that great, great quotation. Who is this? Who is this sir to look for? I am Alpha and Omega. I'm A and Z. Amen. The Greek A and Z. Greek alphabet. Acts 2.36. Peter said, There's not another name given under heaven whereby a man must be saved. Or no, I beg your pardon, misquoting it. He said, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. John 14, 7 and 12. Thomas said, Lord, show us the Father and it's satisfied. said, I've been so long with you, you don't know me. He said, he that seen me has seen the Father. Why says thou show me the Father? I and my Father are one. Amen. I said that one time to a personal lady. He said, just a minute, Mr. Bram. said, you and your wife are one too. I said, but not that kind. She said, I beg your pardon. I said, do you see me? She said, I do. I said, you see my wife? She said, no. I said, then they're a different kind. He said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. <laughs> so that was enough for that. So in St. John, or 1 John 5, 7 to 8, you ought to put it down. 1 John 5, 7 to 8, the Bible said, the speaker, the very same man that wrote this revelation that Jesus gave him, he said, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, the Word is the Son. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There are three that bear record in earth, water, blood, and spirit, and they agree. Not are one, but they agree in one. You cannot have the Father without having the Son. You cannot have Father or Son without having the Holy Ghost. Right. But you And water, blood, and spirit, that's the elements it takes to get into his body. When a natural birth takes place, what's the first thing happen when a woman giving birth to a baby? First thing is water. Second thing is blood. Isn't that right? Next thing is spirit. The baby catches the breath, starts breathing. Water, blood, and spirit. That constitutes the natural birth. Also the spiritual birth. Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Justification by faith. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Water. What's the next? Blood. Sanctification. Cleaning up. Getting around, that's where you Nazarene people failed. You just went that far and didn't go no farther. The vessel is sanctified on the altar, ready for service, but not in service. Blessed are their beatitudes, are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. The vessel is sanctified, that's true. That's like the virgin. The word virgin means pure, holy, unadulterated, sanctified. 
Five had oil and five did not. Five was filled and the other just remained in sanctification. Yeah. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe, you Baptist? Yeah. Presbyterians? We don't know where to be any Holy Ghost. Then how was you baptized? Mm-hmm. After you raised his hands upon them, they were then, after being saved and sanctified, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Right. Water, blood, spirit. Jesus come to wash and to cleanse and to sanctify a church that he might come and live in. With his own blood, he gave his own God-born blood that he might cleanse us from our sexual birth and give unto us a sanctified holy vessel that he himself might come. A little while the world sees me no more, yet ye shall see me because I, personal pronoun, will be with you even in you to the end of the consummation. Amen. All the way through, I'll be with you in any of the works that I do, shall you do also. These times shall follow them that believe. God in the church. Oh, my. Deity. There are three that bear record in heaven. Father, Word, Son, Holy Ghost. They are one. Now, you can be saved without being sanctified. You can be sanctified and not have the Holy Ghost. Right. Sanctified spirit without being filled. Sanctifying your heart. Cleansing your heart without filling it with something. That's why he said when the unclean spirit's gone out of a man, he walks in dry places. Comes back. Finds his house all garnished. He comes in. The uh, last to stay of that person is many times, seven times worse than it was at the first. That's what happened to you, pilgrim holiness, Nazarenes and so forth. You accept that and when the Holy Ghost comes begin to speak in tongues and give signs and wonders, you call the devil and blaspheme the works of God. Call it an unclean thing and you see where your church went? Come out of it! The hour is here. The revelation of Jesus Christ is being taught. God revealed in the power of his demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Day of redemption is near. Now, deity in him. First Timothy three sixteen. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness for God was manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, believed on the world, and seized up in the door. Oh, just on and on and on. But where are we at now? At the end of the 8th verse tonight, we start the, the ninth verse, the Patmos vision. Oh, there's great things in store for us. You love him. Amen. I love you. I in these last days in his churches, making himself known. Now, if these very things that's going on in the church, watch and see at the end of this message that if the Bible don't say these things are to take place. Right. Just exactly. See if they didn't exactly in the Ephesian age and the Pergus, Thyatira, on down every age, told how Luther would do it, how Wesley would do it, and how this Pentecostal denomination would go into a lady of sin, lukewarm condition. But in the midst of that, he pulled the people. Amen. Right. So it's like we're at the end. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, oh, as I see myself breaking away and look at my friends and things and see the world and the, and the chaos that it's in and then think that the coming of the Lord is going to me. We're at the end of the age. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Yes. Everywhere, everybody, there's uh, alarming on the radio all the time. Be ready for an air raid. Take this in, take that in, go down to the basement. How are you going to hide from that? You can't hide from that. Well, that thing will go 150 feet in the ground for 150 miles square. While the concussion of it is it hit, you're shaking an apple to the ground. While it's just blowing an apple to pieces, it hit right in low. See? One of those. Hard to tell what they got besides that. And look, you don't have to. You don't rush. You don't have to. That Cuba can do that. Amen. Any little bitty place, uh, a little bitty place the size of Alcatraz, I can do it. Cover the whole world. One thing you have to do is just line it up and pull one string. 
You don't need no army. You just need one fanatic to do it in the hands of the devil. That's exactly right. You do it. Then the whole thing is over. It's all over then. But, oh, let me give you this blessed thing. When we see that so close, when we see that, it could happen before morning. Remember, the church goes home before that happens. The rapture takes place before. Now, she might not get twisted up. Remember, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, remember, before any rain fell, Noah was in the ark. See? Noah was in the ark. He is carried over through the... And now Noah was a type of the Jews. But Enoch went home without dying. And when Noah seen Enoch go, he knows it's time to start on that ark. <laughs> right. That was Noah's sign when Enoch went home. And as soon as the Gentile church is taken away, then he makes himself known to Israel. See? That's right. Remember, in the days of Lot, as Jesus said, before one speck of fire ever hit the earth, that angel said, hasten, hurry, get out of here, for I can't do nothing until thou hast come hence. Before any fire hit, Lot and his family was out and gone. So the rapture will come before the tribulation sets in. The tribulation... Many people get that mixed up. We'll get it straight in this week, the Lord willing, by the help of the Lord. Remember, you're looking for a great tribulation period. That was, if you type that in the Bible, that was Jacob's troubled age, you see. When he was troubled, that had nothing to do with the Gentiles. The Gentile has nothing to do, no type in the Bible to that. The Gentile church is raptured. And you're looking for the water to turn into blood and things like that. That comes over to Israel again, back at it with Moses and Elijah. When they return Elijah for the fourth time, returns back. And the Spirit, neither of those was dead or the Moses that died, they didn't know where they buried him. His vow would be raised up somewhere between then and that because on Mount Transfiguration there he was talking to Jesus. Him. So they'll come back and be killed and lay in the spiritual street called Sodom where our Lord was crucified, Jerusalem. And it'll be preached to the Jews and smite the earth and close the heavens and so forth like that. And the end of the Gentile ministry will carry over and connect with that and the Gentiles will go home and that ministry will go on. There will be the doom of all things. Two-thirds of the earth fell and everything else when them dead bodies laid in the street three days. Watch what kind it was. Look at these pictures that I got from down in South America. When they killed that Pentecostal missionary there, his wife raised in the street and him and two little children, little girls, a little belly swelled up like that. They wouldn't even bear him walk on spitting there on him like that for three or four days. Brother Cop taking the picture, I got him at home. See? The way they do. Then they send gifts one to another. Look how that types in the Bible. You see what church is going to do that. Right. Uh, right at hand and moving right in like a snake right now. Just as cunning as it could be. Sign of things right down. Look at the prophecy the Lord gave me in 33, how it would happen. They'd permit women to vote and vote and elect the wrong person. Seven things is given. Five of them's already happened. The next thing was a great woman, a church, a power, or something to take over this United States to rule. Then I seen it just like ashes hey, running. Before it comes to the end. It's the end time. It said they'd have a machine that could drive. They didn't have to have no driver in it. They just perfected it. It said 11 years. The Holy Spirit said to me, there it is on paper. You can't. It can't be denied. There it is on paper. The Holy Spirit said 11 years before the Maginot Line was built. I said the Germans, America, or this President Roosevelt will be the rascal of all of them. And that's right. He was. Not hurt you Democrats' feelings. But I, I'm telling you, it's now Democrat or Republican now. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That we're I'm neither Democrat nor Republican. I'm a Christian. So then, they, uh, whatever it was that you noticed there. And look here the other day if you want to see what a renegade bunch that is. Taking those machines and fixing them wherever time you vote for Mr. Nixon, you had to vote for this other fellow at the same time. Hey, G. Edgar Hoover pulled the machines out. How many have been reading it? I'm sure it's all yeah. the whole papers, news, and everything else. You see where we're at? There's nothing honest no more but Christ. Amen. 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 Oh, that blessed old book. Amen. That's it. That's the only one that tells you who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. Amen. Yes, sir. This blessed old book. Oh, that makes me love him, don't you? Amen. Faith in the Father. Faith in the Son. Faith in the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Demons will tremble and sinners awake. Faith in Jehovah makes anything shake. <laughs> what a great day is ahead of us, friends. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to his angel and come and signified it to John, Amen. that it might be known through the church ages the thing that's in store for us. May the Lord bless us now as we stand to our feet. And every who's playing the piano, give us a little card. If you will, uh, take the name of Jesus with you. Now, listen, there is no doubt there's strangers here among us in the tabernacle this morning. I want you to shake their hands, invite them, go home with you, and what more, and make everybody welcome. I want everybody to be sure to do that. And remember, the service will start at 7 o'clock tonight, and at 7.30, I'll be speaking the vision on Patmos. Tomorrow night, the Lord willing, I'll be speaking on the first church age, Ephesus, uh, the church age. Now we're going to sing, take the name of Jesus with you, our little tabernacle dismissing song, and let everyone sing now. All right. Take the name of Jesus with you. somebody in front of you, at the side of you, at the back of you, say, Christian Pilgrim, friend, I'm glad to have you here this morning, glad to fellowship with you around the things of God, you know, we've had a great time, hope to see you here again tonight, something like that, as you shake hands with people in front of you, back of you, around you, at the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh-huh. 